Hi everybody and welcome to the Electronics and Programming Beginner's Guide. As you can see behind me, we've got an upgrade. So from now on, it should be a lot easier to uh, draw up and discuss some of the topics that we'll be talking about in the future. Something that I do want to mention is that uh, the surface is very reflective and I've been trying very hard to keep uh, glare off of it as much as I can but unfortunately I can't eliminate all of the glare. So I, I'm aware of the problem and I'm working to figure out some uh, solutions for it but at least for now so there's, there's just some minor glare on it. So today we're going to be talking about interrupts. Uh, interrupts are fantastic and magical things. You can do so many things with interrupts. As you saw from uh, my, what was that? That was the uh, software for the uh, DSPIC33 Blink uh, video. The entire code, uh, the entire main loop of the code is empty. There's nothing in it and everything is done with an interrupt. And that's how powerful interrupts can be. Because, and, uh, well, let's, let's step back a second and let's kind of go back to basic. What is an interrupt? So imagine you're baking some cookies and you have a timer set, you know how long the cookies take to bake and you're playing a video game. So once the timer for the cookies runs out, it starts ringing. You have to go take the cookies out of the oven. So you pause your game, you walk over to the kitchen, you take the cookies out of the oven and they need to cool, you can't eat them right away, so you go back and you uh, unpause the game and continue playing. And that's exactly how an interrupt works and what it does. So the idea is you're in the main code or you're playing the video game and uh, an interrupt source triggers. When the interrupt source triggers, the main code will pause and save where you're at right now and then jump over to the interrupt. Once the interrupt has been taken care of, you jump back over into the main code and continue as though nothing had, you know, as though there was no pause. And that's what makes interrupts so powerful because there are so many different interrupt sources that, that are available in the microcontroller. Uh, as we saw from my previous video, you can have a timer interrupt. So you can have very, very uh, critical timing events occur right now. I need to turn something on with the specific event. So when the uh, event occurs, the interrupt can automatically and quickly, that's the, the best part, uh, turn something on. Uh, you can have uh, interrupts for communication or whenever a message is has been read in and is available, you can fire an interrupt to let you know that, hey, I need to uh, check my comms. Uh, you can have interrupts for uh, pin changes. Let's say this pin goes from low to high and boom, an interrupt fires and you know that this is what occurred. When an interrupt occurs, the main program stops and the interrupt uh, jumps over to uh, some location in memory. Uh, this is commonly referred to as an interrupt vector. So the, the interrupt kind of points to a location in memory. Uh, all of this information is stored in something called an interrupt vector table that uh, will have a map of the different locations to jump over to. And there are essentially two different kinds of interrupts. You can have a, a single vector interrupt or you can have a multi-vector interrupt. The idea of how they actually work is the same for both. The difference being is for a single uh, vector interrupt, regardless of what interrupt uh, triggered the, the event, you will always jump over to a single location in memory. In the case of a multi-vector interrupt, the location to which you jump over really depends on what interrupt triggered the event. So for example, if a, a UART interrupt will uh, fire uh, this, uh, will jump over to this memory space, a uh, 
interrupt on change, like a pin change, will jump over here, and a timer one will jump over here. So both setups have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the advantage of the single vector interrupt is it's very simple, uh, it's very small, it's very effective on space, and it doesn't uh, require a whole lot of circuitry to implement. Uh, the downside is you can have some issues with latencies as far as how the interrupts uh, occur. So for example, if you have an interrupt occur and you jump over, while you're taking care of that one, another interrupt fires, you have to finish leaving the loop to leaving the interrupt to go back in. In the case of uh, multi-vector interrupts, they are more complex. They require essentially more silicon, more circuitry to implement, but these can be very, very fast because uh, each vector has, each interrupt has its own vector. And uh, these kinds of interrupts can actually interrupt each other. It's called nesting. So if you're in a your uh, interrupt where you have data coming in and you have a timer that goes off that has a higher priority, you can actually interrupt the first interrupt with another interrupt take care of that and then go back to what you were doing. So the the memory address that you jump over into is called the interrupt service routine or ISR. The interrupt service routine is the little snippet of code that you put into essentially the memory location. And you don't need, even really need to think of it as a memory location. It's better to think of it as an interrupt service routine because the compiler uh, takes care of for you of placing things in the correct memory locations and building the interrupt vector table in memory for you. So the first thing we really need to know about an interrupt is that an interrupt is a function. Whenever a uh, interrupt occurs, you vector to the interrupt service routine, and the interrupt service routine is a function. That function does have some limits. The two basic <laughs> limits of the function are that it is always uh, has an output uh, void and an input void. You cannot pass anything into an interrupt, and you can't pass anything out of their interrupt. So what you're limited to is you have to use global variables if you want to uh, record something from a function. For, I'm sorry, from the interrupt service routine. So uh, this is a just a very uh, pseudocode basic prototype for a, a single uh, vector interrupt. Uh, this is modeled on something that you would use in the uh, uh, PIC 16 F1508. And uh, where you find some of the stuff are in the user manual and linker manual for the compiler. Because the compiler will tell you that uh, things like this right here are important in how to write them. In the case of the uh, XC8 compiler and that processor, the, uh, this underscore ISR is the keyword that the compiler needs to know to place this function uh, in the memory location for interrupts. In this case, the name of the function is entirely irrelevant, and it is this keyword that places it in the correct location. So how does a, a single vector interrupt work? Well, first of all, there are some uh, terms that you need to know. And that is, uh, every interrupt has an enable. Uh, usually, uh, it's referred to as IE, interrupt and enable. If an interrupt is enabled, you, so you've uh, set uh, the setting from a 0 to a 1, when the interrupt source is met, you know, the event has occurred, uh, the uh, interrupt flag, usually denoted as IF, is set to a 1, and when the, the processor has finished its current operation, it will save what's happening and jump over to the interrupt. So with a single vector interrupt, uh, 
you do not know which source triggered the interrupt. So you have to, if you, especially if you have multiple interrupts, you have to check. So as you come into the interrupt, you have to check if the flag, the, the IF, the interrupt flag for your event one, just as a, as a very general example, has triggered, then you need to do stuff meaning that you need to react to the interrupt. And I'm going to say this now, I'm going to keep repeating myself. You want to make the interrupt as short and sweet as possible. So if you can perform this do stuff uh, section in just a couple of lines of code, that code in a couple of lines of code, there we go, it's perfect. If you think about calling a function from uh, the interrupt, uh, rethink how you're doing your code. Once you finish doing your stuff, uh, that interrupt flag that was set needs to be cleared. So you have to clear the flag for the specific interrupt. After you're done with the section of code, then you check to see if any other flags for interrupts have uh, come up. And then same thing, you check to see if the flag was set, do some more stuff, clear the flag, and you can have a whole large list of these. So the, uh, the advantages to this kind of setup is that an interrupt can never interrupt another interrupt, as confusing as that sentence sounds. So if you, if you triggered an interrupt for event one, while you're servicing event one, event two can throw an interrupt flag and event one will finish. There's no interrupting. And the same thing works in reverse. Let's say interrupt true to, to trigger the event. So you come into the interrupt, you check to see if event one has triggered and it hasn't. So then you move on to event two. While you're servicing event two, event one triggers, you're going to finish and leave the interrupt, re-trigger the interrupt and come back in. So that actually brings up the second weakness, and that's sometimes you can have uh, latencies. So if you, you know, if you have ten different interrupts that can trigger a source, you know, if you're a servicing interrupt two and interrupt one triggers, you still have to check and service the other interrupts before you come back around to the top. Now that you know what an interrupt service routine looks like for an 8-bit microcontroller for the 8-bit PICs, I just wanted to again mention that uh, the syntax for how to actually write the interrupt service routine can be found in either the uh, XC8 uh, user guide or the XC8 uh, linker and assembly guide. And I said uh, both of those are fantastic reads for how to actually write the interrupt service routine. And it took me a very long time to find that information. What I've done in the past is just grab chunks out of example code. I didn't know where to actually look. But now that you know how to write that, uh, the interrupt service routine, how do you actually set up the interrupt? And this is just kind of a short list of the steps I follow when setting up an interrupt. And this is specifically for the 8-bit microcontrollers, mm -hmm. and uh, not necessarily all of these steps are necessary, but some of uh, to do them in this step is a good idea because it gives you uh, uh, some things to follow. Like, for example, so you have a device and you want to set up interrupts for it. So first you want to turn off the device. Uh, whenever you're uh, configuring the processor when it first powers on, this is kind of irrelevant because the device is already off. But in the case of your reconfiguring the device, you always want to turn the device off first because uh, screwing around with the control registers while the device is on can have strange and weird effects that you may not be able to predict. So whenever I write, whenever I configure my devices, just in case, I always like to throw that in there. If I have to call the uh, function again to reinitialize the device, or something along those lines, it, it, I'm safe just running it outright because I turn the device off first. So after I turn the device off, you configure the device, meaning you set up all of its settings, etc. Then you clear the interrupt flag. This step is important when you're setting it up because it's possible that the interrupt, interrupt flag was set, or if you're reconfiguring the device, this kind of works the same as the turning off the device. You want to make sure you clear the flag. 
because if the flag isn't clear, as soon as you move on to the next step, which is the set uh, interrupt enable, uh, you can drop right into an interrupt inadvertently, where maybe there's some other stuff you need to take care of first. So it's you turn off the device, configure device, uh, clear the interrupt flag, uh, set the uh, interrupt enable, and then go ahead and turn on the device. In the 8-bit microcontrollers, they said like the PIC16F, there's also two other things that you have to turn on. The, you have to enable the peripheral interrupts, and there's several versions, several different peripheral interrupts. They're all grouped together, and then enable the global interrupts. This peripheral one is the one to watch out for because it, this one is very, very commonly missed. And like I said, uh, you could have uh, a UART peripheral that's in one enable, and you could have an uh, ADC peripheral that's in another enable, and then you would have to enable the two peripherals and then enable the global interrupts. When you get to 16-bit picks, uh, defining the interrupt it becomes a little more confusing. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, uh, XC16 uh, uh, user guide, it, what it defines to you is an attribute that you add to a uh, function which makes that function an interrupt. And let's, because I don't have, essentially I don't have enough board space to be able to write the whole function declaration out, I'm going to uh, uh, take this out in sections. So this attribute command, it's double underscore attribute double underscore uh, applies an attribute to a function. The attribute that it implies is the interrupt attribute and uh, with the interrupt attribute I add the no auto PSV function. So this is really nice and confusing, so for, especially for beginners it's very difficult to uh, wrap your head around this. But it's a, the, the, the simplest thing is that you're adding an attribute, that attribute is an interrupt and this no auto PSV stands for no auto program uh, uh, space visibility. And I may talk about this later, uh, but in uh, the very simple description is that if you, if you have any variables that are declared constants that you're accessing, accessing from the interrupt, you want to make this auto PSV. If you do not have any variables that are constants that are being accessed by the interrupt, then you want to make this no auto PSV. So how do you make this a little bit simpler? So you can use something called the pound define. So for the pound define, you would, uh, it's um, pound sign define. And then you take all of this, and there's a space right here. You want to put this here. And then very similar to what the 8-bit uh, picks look like, what you can define is underscore ISR. And this, uh, I'm, uh, from now on, I'm going to use this and my rest of the 16-bit uh, uh, pick descriptions. But this instead stands for this and you can do a shorthand where the compiler will actually replace every instance it sees of this underscore ISR with this attribute interrupt yada 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 stuff. As I mentioned previously the 16-bit picks support a uh, multi-vector interrupts meaning that there is a separate vector separate interrupt service routine or ISR that you can call for each one of your interrupts. So how does that look like? That looks something like this. I just did uh, two functions. So void and this is the shorthand for that attribute interrupt yada yada yada. And then the function name. In this case unlike the 8-bit picks where the function name was irrelevant, in this specific case the function name is very very relevant. Uh, you can find a full list of interrupt function names in the XC16 uh, assembly uh, and linker guide. But this name is important because this name maps to a specific point in memory. So whenever the interrupt is uh, triggered, the uh, 
program will actually jump to the specific address for this function. And let's say all of these functions have very specific names because there is a separate address, so to speak, for each one of the different interrupts. But the general idea is exactly the same as it was in the ABM fix, that you have a function, you can't pass anything into the function, and you can't pass anything out of the function, so void and void. Once you enter the function, you do some sort of stuff, and again, you want to keep this short and sweet. Once you're done doing your stuff, you clear the flag and exit the function. Then, it, let's uh, uh, this one is for the uh, timer one interrupt, and then this one is for the your one receive interrupt. I said this one will get called whenever the timer interrupt flag triggers, and this one will get called whenever the UART receives uh, a message. Uh, one pitfall that I want to mention of the uh, multi uh, vector interrupt setup if you enable an interrupt, you must have a function, an interrupt service routine to service it. Because what happens is, if there's this function does not exist, whenever the interrupt triggers, you just jump over to blank memory, memory where there's nothing at, and your processor crashes. So if you're having strange problems after you enable an interrupt, uh, check to see if you have A, written a function altogether, or B, that you wrote the correct function, because if this name does not match the interrupt that you enabled, your processor will crash because it jumps over into nothingness. No program at all. Now that you know how to write an interrupt service routine for a 16-bit pick, how do you configure the interrupt? As you can see here, the list is very similar to what uh, the 8-bit picks look like, with just a couple of differences. So you have a device. First, you want to turn the device off. Like I mentioned, you don't want to be reconfiguring a device that's already running. You can uh, have some strange consequences that happen from that. Uh, after you turn the device off, you want to configure it. Then you want to uh, clear the interrupt flag. And again, uh, same thing, that if uh, uh, the flag is set whenever you uh, set the interrupt enabled, a bit, then you could possibly trigger an interrupt when you're not ready for it. So always just as a, as a safety rule, clear the interrupt flag. And then you set the priority. What the priority does is that uh, if multiple interrupts trigger at the same time, uh, the priority level will uh, choose which interrupt gets triggered first and then which interrupt gets triggered second. So uh, by default, uh, an interrupt priority level is 4, but it could be as low as 7 or as high as 0. If your priority level is 0, it's almost un uh, it's, it almost has the highest priority. The only way that an interrupt could have a higher priority level than 0 is because interrupts also have a natural priority order. Uh, if you look in the data sheet at the full list of available interrupts, they're actually listed to you in the natural order. So if you have two interrupts that trigger that are fours at the same time, then uh, the list uh, of natural priority order will choose which interrupt uh, gets triggered first and which one gets triggered se uh, second. If you have a four and a zero that get triggered at the same time, the zero will get serviced first, and then the four will get serviced after that. Uh, essentially, the if multiple interrupts trigger at the same time, the ones with the lower priority will wait in a queue. So after you set the priority level, then you want to enable the uh, interrupt, and then you want to turn on your device. Uh, another quick word of caution. Uh, the 16-bit uh, PICs also support interrupt nesting. What nesting means is that you can, if you turn on this feature, you can actually trigger an interrupt inside another interrupt. What that's controlled with is, again, the interrupt priority level. So if you're sitting, if you're servicing a uh, priority level 4 interrupt and a priority level 0 interrupt comes up, uh, 
the priority zero interrupt will actually trigger inside the priority four interrupt, service it, and then resume you back into the priority four interrupt. The issue with this is the processor has a limited number of nested interrupts it can support because of the way the internal hardware uh, saves your context and your variables, etc. So you, if you enable uh, interrupt nesting, I would be very careful about how many interrupts can be uh, nested inside each other, etc. This has been a very basic introduction to interrupts. So this was not meant to be a comprehensive guide. It was just meant to be an introduction and to give you some pointers on where to find information and how to use that information. Because I find that that's the biggest struggle sometimes is where do you find the information? And if I had uh, a guide like this to point me in the direction of the information, I would have been very grateful because it said I spent many a times just robbing uh, code, uh, robbing uh, functions out of example code because I didn't actually know where to find them. Said, so, uh, hopefully you like the new board. Said, so I tried as hard as I can to, as hard as I could to keep the glare off of it. And uh, uh, please subscribe to my YouTube videos. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in either the YouTube uh, uh, video or on my website.